Hello, hi everyone. I'm uh, I'm really I'm really uh, excited. Well, I I I'm really sort of you know proud to uh, uh, to see this uh, de development uh, coming about Colorcons, and I'm really glad that uh, there's quite a few people who are interested because I personally um, I find it absolutely interesting. I I have this. Sort of notion that um, you know for for years we've had um, well that's quite a long time ago though uh, we've had a black and white photography photography was only black and white and you know for 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 many many years people would assume that uh, photography is just black and white but then at some point color photography came along and uh, now it's quite obvious this, that photography is color. And black and white photography still exists as a sort of a high-end artistic uh, um, thing for special purposes. So um, I think with typography, it's also um, similar. And I want to show you a few uh, sort of tidbits and uh, just give you an overview of uh, what currently the situation is with open type um, with open type uh, fonts and color support in them. And uh, then I will show you how to make, how to create some of these fonts um, using the tools uh, that are available today. Um, and then also I'll um, also show you a, a few more things that are slightly more advanced that are maybe not necessarily um, accessible to everyone because some of the tools I'll be showing are sort of pretty easy to use. Some of them are involve a certain sort of workarounds and tricks, um, but they're still manageable. And then there's some sort of tech wizardry that is not necessarily uh, very easy for everyone, but I want to mention these uh, as well. So, um, let me uh, just take it away with um, with this. So, you know, we sort of consider, or that one of the traditional terms for typography is the black art, um, and that has, you know, a long, long tradition in printing. Obviously, printing uh, using just one color uh, was very easy, and that was that's what how it started. So, when we look at you know what typographers uh, describe as color, it's usually uh, it's usually this. It's sort of like the evenness of gray on a page. And of course, you know, some might say, well, you know, proper type and uh, typefaces never dealt with color in any way. Well, is it true? No, of course not necessarily. I mean, we we had color coming into use uh, from very early on. Well, some, some might say, okay, the Gutenberg Bible, right? The, the, the very first, uh, one of the very first uh, books printed using movable type is black and white only. And that is, um, well, you could say sort of true, but um, if you, look at it, well, not quite. I mean, there is some color already in the Gutenberg Bible, and actually there's lots of color. Um, well, some might say, okay, but this is, you know, not printing, this is uh, handwritten or um, ha hand illuminated, but still, I mean, we have letter forms that are different colors, and we have even these initials that are, yes, they're hand illuminated, but, uh, well, these days hardly anything. Uh, involving publications is really done by hand. So let's look at this. This is actually from uh, the mid 18th uh, century. It's um, it's a multicolor font from uh, sorry from the mid 19th century uh, from the uh, William and H uh, William H Page Foundry, an American foundry that produced these uh, these fonts. They were made using Sort of layers as uh, actual wood type. Uh, so you would have uh, one layer that was used for printing one color, uh, and you, you had 
different say, set of type that would um, that would be used to print another color. And um, it was called American Chromatic um, and uh, P22 um, and the Hamilton Woodside Museum have collaborated on uh, on digitizing this. And this was done. Uh, this is available on Microns as a digital as a set of digital fonts where every single of these layers is available as a single uh, open type font. It was done, you know, in FontLab Studio with some uh, really very very careful planning. So every single of these fonts has the same metrics and uses is, is sort of point compatible in a sense or at least shape compatible, so that once you overlay these. Uh, and that's possible using, you know, traditional desktop application uh, programs, uh, the DTP programs, or using the web in in desktop publishing applications. You just, um, you know, make create a frame, typeset the text using one font, duplicate the frame, put it exactly on top, and change the font to the other layer, assign different colors, and you might have this effect. This is uh, also, it's actually easier to do with uh, on the web because um, CSS and some tricks allow you to do this. There is uh, uh, on, on webfonts.info, a web page run by, by my fonts, there is a little tutorial on this called layering type using CSS. Um, and these um, techniques allow you to get these effects on a web. Uh, that's actually uh, a demo page from the uh, American Chromatic uh, font. Um, we have a tool um, that I'll show you later uh, in more details that makes it easy to do this type of layering and actually produces uh, these pre-colored uh, layered fonts out of these kinds of ingredients. So if you already have drawn uh, a font family that uses uh, that is made uh, using these layers. So you have one font for one layer, another font for another layer, which are all metric compatibly metrically compatible. You can use Transcype 4 to produce uh, these versions uh, of fonts that will not require the user, the end user, to do this, uh, you know, CSS layering or maybe these duplicating of frames and doing the trickery. In their app, in their apps, at least some of the apps um, that already support color fonts, this will be uh, done much easier. Um, but first, you know, let's have a look at what uh, technologies we have available in principle. So obviously, we all know that it all actually started from monochrome bitmap fonts. You know, the first, um, probably one of the first font editors available, fantastic, uh, written by uh, the guys at uh, Altsys, the same guys who then later created um, Photographer. The first uh, editor, fantastic, was a bitmap, um, monochrome bitmap font editor, and there were quite, quite a few in the early days, and most of the operating systems uh, before uh, Mac OS, the classic, and before Windows 3.1, they used bitmap fonts. You know, you had DOS, you had all kinds of Unix systems, the old versions of Mac OS and of um, Windows, they use bitmap fonts, but they're sort of long forgotten, except special applications like these big, you know, uh, displays uh, that are used on know, public signage or buses, some of them animated, they basically use bitmap or pixel fonts. But the vast majority of us have sort of grown up as type designers uh, with this understanding that fonts are monochrome outline fonts these days. The digital fonts are made out of outlines and they all have the same one color. So basically, there's only an area that is filled and there is an area that is not filled. And the whole notion of with what you fi fill this filled area happens later. So of course, it's possible to assign a different color than black in an app. You can change the font's color to be red or blue or have a gradient, but all the glyphs in a monochrome outline font get the same treatment and there's only one color or one kind of fill that you can easily apply unless you go glyph by glyph or 
you know, convert the text, uh, the text to outlines and then do some trickery as an illustrator or, or user. Um, but now we have two kind of new approaches on the table. One is uh, multicolor or color. By color, I say, I, I mean um, uh, technologies that allow you to use more than one color inside of glyph uh, descriptions. Uh, it still is possible to actually make it one color that is pre-set or pre-recorded in the glyphs. For example, uh, you could make uh, a color font technology is also one where in the font, all the glyphs are said to be red and the user has no very easy way to change that. That's also color. So color primarily means multicolor, but it doesn't necessarily also mean millions of colors at the same time. It can be two or uh, three. Here we see two examples. And the two fundamental uh, technology sort of uh, branches are bitmap based and outline based. And both have their advantages and disadvantages. And I'll show you some examples later why one approach is better uh, for one kind of uh, designs and a different approach is better for a different kind of designs. But the, the most important thing to keep in mind is when you think of sort of very, very early versions of tools such as Illustrator or Freehand or Corel Draw that only allowed you that were outline or vector graphic applications, but they only allowed you very simple fills. So you know, uh, as we know with with outline graphics, with vector graphics, we can do solid. We can have a shape that is filled with one solid color and uh, maybe a gradient, but when it comes to really very tiny uh, differences or some special treatment, sort of photographic effects, uh, as it were, we use bitmaps. So we use, at the same time, we use Photoshop and Illustrator. And this is sort of the same kind of distinction. So there are kinds of effects and kinds of lettering uh, that you might be uh, better off using Photoshop. And there are others that uh, are better off using Illustrator. And this is the same distinction here. So both have, both bitmap and outline-based color fonts have their, uh, their sort of rights to exist, and, and they actually exist already uh, because of implementation. So let's have a look. Um, originally, uh, talking about just open type, uh, because let's forget all the older, the, they used to be older, uh, technologies that allowed some of these effects already. There were the so-called SVG fonts introduced um, very early on, like 10 years ago into, um, into SVG, the web uh, graphic standard, but they never really, um, they never, never really worked. And that's not what we are going to talk about today. And some of you may remember uh, PostScript type 3 fonts that allowed you to basically uh, use any postscript a drawing um, uh, uh, drawing routines, uh, including strokes and uh, different fills and gradients and things like that, um, and multicolor. Uh, but they also never really worked on desktop systems, so they were kind of a curiosity. But what we're looking now, as of 2014, is open type fonts, uh, or basically the open type font container that has some glyph definitions, but also have a lot of other things such as uh, open type layout features, information about Unicode, uh, and all these things that we sort of associate with open type fonts. For them, the glyph definitions, as we uh, know them today, come in two flavors. One is the glyph table that uses the true type outline descriptions. And uh, that was sort of introduced by Apple many years ago and uh, then also extended and extensively used by Microsoft. And the other is the CFF table inside of the OpenType font file that uses PostScript glyph descriptions using the Bezier curves. And that was developed by Adobe based on their older Type 1 uh, font format. 
And that's the two flavors that we're familiar with. The fonts with the true type glyph table usually comes with the uh, file extension TTF. The ones with a CFF come with the extension OTF. And they work pretty much everywhere. Now, a few years back, Apple has uh, introduced a special additional table that is placed inside of the true type or open type font called SBIX. And that's uh, a table that stores bitmap uh, glyph descriptions um, that can be multicolor, uh, primarily using PNG graphics. PNG is a popular internet uh, graphics format that stores millions of million can store sort of millions and millions of colors, sorry, 24 bit graphics um, with uh, alpha transparency, which is also important, and with um, some compression. And it's lossless compression. It's, um, it's been what you see most of the non photographic uh, images that you see on the web these days, or, or still many, are mm, using PNG, all kinds of um, you know, vector-like um, arrows and uh, toolbars and uh, things like that. And then Google last year introduced an alternative uh, approach to the same thing. Uh, they have two tables, CBDT and CBLC, uh, that is also bitmap-based color graphic uh, glyph descriptions. And that's sort of the, it's basically the contents of them of these is the same, they're just um, expressed using different data formats, and we'll see how they develop. Um, and then we have a pure vector graphic solution um, introduced by Microsoft, again, last year. Um, and that comes with two tables. One is a color table, a C-O-L-R color table, and the other is CPAL color palette table. That is a format that um, uh, that is very much like uh, vector graphics in the you know early 90s. So you can have uh, different shapes that uh, together produce a glyph, but each of the shapes can just have one solid color. So if you think of uh, you know things like um, road signs you know, uh, where you may have a red border, uh, white still, and inside some kind of shape. So altogether, you may have three colors, red and white and black. And these are three solid fills. And this is um, the, the Microsoft format allows for these kinds of um, multicolor graphics. So they're fully scalable because they're outline based, they're vector based, and they allow in the CPAL table, at least for now theoretically, because there aren't really any apps that use that, to store multiple color palettes. So you may have one glyph that has three different colors, but the actual colors, which they are, they can be stored in a palette, and so the user could change, do I want uh, you know, a yellow um, smiley uh, that has uh, blue eyes, or do I want a red smiley that has green eyes? And the shape can be the two shapes, eyes and the smiley can be stored in one glyph. And then the blue plus uh, yellow or green plus red combinations are stored in a palette. That's again, plain outlines, no uh, difference, no stroke variation, no gradients, nothing of the kind, but it's very simple and very effective. And then we have the most advanced of them all, that is SVG, the scalable vector graphics um, that is sort of uh, omnipresent now on the web. It's it's a web standard, has been for many years, has been originally developed by Adobe, uh, and is part of uh, pretty much any browser now. Uh, and SVG glyph descriptions can be also put inside of the uh, OpenType font file. Uh, they can mix everything. They're basically a hybrid or a superset because you can have bitmap elements or pure bitmaps inside of SVG, or you can have pure outlines, or you can have, uh, let's say, an outline glyph with a drop shadow that is a bitmap and has a blur. 
that's all possible using SVG and uh, SVG inside of OpenType, and that's being co-developed by Adobe and Mozilla. So we we see a couple of players here, and if you look at this table, we used to have Apple plus Microsoft and Adobe, and we see the same companies again: Apple, we have Microsoft, we have Adobe, and we have the two big internet players, Google and Mozilla. So it's basically the same companies that are proposing their formats. And these all formats are sort of on the table, primarily the Microsoft and the Adobe Mozilla formats. So color and SVG will probably both become part of the actual open type standard um, in a few months or maybe next year. But there are implementations of them are already shipping. And this is sort of a short overview. So as I said, the original two, black and white monochrome uh, work everywhere. The SBIX uh, table uh, inside of OpenType fonts, uh, that works in Mac OS 10 uh, version 10.7, uh, which was, I think, Leopard, and uh, no, sorry, Snow Leopard, and newer, so Snow Leopard, Lion, Mountain Lion, and also in iOS, so on the iPad, uh, on the iPhone, and it works inside of uh, Mac OS X. It works in many applications, including you know text edit, Safari, Keynote, Pages, also Microsoft Word. It doesn't work in Adobe apps. Uh, then we have the Google proposal, which is currently only working in sort of open source implementations in newer versions of the free type rasterizer. We have um, the Microsoft proposal, Color and CPAL, that only works on Windows 8.1 8. 8. 8. 8. Um, in some applications, not all applications. Again, certainly not Adobe apps, but the Microsoft's own apps, uh, such as Office, um, I believe, the newest version of Office uh, support that, and also apps like Internet Explorer 11, um, and increasingly apps that use just the standard system font rendering out of Windows 8.1, uh, they will support that. And then we have the final SVG uh, inside of OpenType, which currently is only supported by Firefox version 26 uh, and newer. So the current Firefox that you have uh, will support these. Um, but Adobe has plans to add support of that format into all their apps. Uh, Gradually, of course, Adobe has a lot of apps and they're sort of all uh, using different fonts, renderers, and things like that. So it'll, it will take some time, but Adobe is definitely backing that. And that's the most ambitious, ambitious um, sort of format because it allows you to do pretty much everything. Now, um, all these things that I just talked about, there is a much more in depth uh, view on these. If you visit blog.fontlab.com, if there is a, um, a color font proposals article that I've written that is quite technical and really takes you uh, through the pros and cons and the different specs and um, links to some tools um, and sort of overall an evaluation of all these formats. Um, so if you're interested, uh, this is sort of the, uh, this is a good read, but it's quite technical. So. It's mostly for those of you who you know who have read the open type who are aware or understand the open type uh, font uh, format spec or standard um, now um, again the application and OS support of these formats the Microsoft format uh, color CPAL is as I said uh, supported in in Windows 8.1 this is a screenshot from Internet Explorer 11 that is using these fonts. So what you see here is not a graphic, and it's also not a layering of several fonts. It's just one font that is being displayed as a web font. Mm. The Apple SBIX table is um, supported in Mac OS X. So this is text edit uh, using just uh, color fonts. Uh, completely natively. This is um, pages where the heading is typeset using a color font. Um, this is 
uh, a screenshot from my iPad, where, as you can see, there is the font list, and the final, the last font uh, that I put on my iPad is a color font using SPX, and I can use it in Pages or Keynote, um, just like any other font, without you know having to uh, resort to some tricks. I just type, and all the glyphs appear. Now, the Adobe Mozilla proposal, SVG inside of OpenType, that works in, in Firefox. And this is a screenshot of uh, Pablo Impolari's font testing page. I've taken um, this particular font that is um, SVG-based font that uses bitmap graphics inside. I've uploaded it there. And you can see that even OpenType features are working. If you look at the word office there or flag, uh, they all work in Firefox. They won't work yet in other browsers. But as I said, it's all sort of, at this point, uh, if you decide to you know, create a multicolor font, you have to be aware that you know, some formats will not support certain effects. Uh, and of course, uh, the easiest, uh, I'm going to get back to that uh, later, which ones will work where, or which kind of artwork will work where. Um, fortunately, uh, at FontLab, we have um, sort of tried to, you know, make sure that because this native support of these formats is still very spotty, we have created this little app called FontLab Pad, and that app allows you to, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tiny text editor where you can open a font, any font, uh, that our new app support. It can be even a UFO, if you uh, so will, or a VFB, but particularly all these color fonts. And you can typeset some text, you can make the background uh, transparent, and you can then export the text into a graphic and put it into the artwork you're working on. So this is a, a simple illustration of the concept. Let's, let's assume I'm working in Photoshop on some uh, comp, and I have my photo. I open FontLab Pad, I drop a font, I typeset my text, and then I make the, um, I, I hit on the transparent background button in FontLab Pad so I can overlay, I can see what the text will look like when placed uh, over what I'm working on. And then when I'm happy, I say save as, I choose either PNG or PDF or SVG, all these three output formats for that particular uh, lettering or heading, headline, and then I paste it into Photoshop or Illustrator or pretty much any app that supports um, uh, PDF, PNG, or SVG. Of course, this is not editable text. So FontLab Pad is just a sort of a bridge for you, a free app available from fontlab.com uh, slash pad um, for both Mac and Windows. Um, so when you're developing uh, a color font in any of the formats. You can point your customers to fontlab.com slash pad and say, okay, here's a free app. You know, in some apps, the font I made will work natively. In the ones that don't support color fonts yet, you can use fontlab pad to make these little headlines and um, just paste them. Um, it's fairly, it's, it's, it's quite an okay, and I'm going to uh, show it a bit later, sort of in action. So, some examples. Um, if you look at the, you know, my fonts bestsellers list, you will notice that some of the fonts that are in even the, the best-selling category, they're sort of trying to use monochrome vector effects to sort of simulate what would actually probably be. Uh, a, a bitmap uh, effect. So, for instance, Brandon printed quite obviously. Uh, you see it in number 13 at my fonts uh, by Hannah Van Doren. That's uh, a font that was created actually as a, using bitmap sort of these washing effects, and then uh, auto traced and turned into a traditional open type font. And that's sort of like you know, that's where the monochrome uh, font technology is sort of not perfect. A uh, color font technology, even if it were just one color, but really using the true, you know, bitmap effect with 
semi-transparency where needed would probably be better. Quite a few of the calligraphic fonts, uh, you know, that are also now expressed as sort of pure outlines, maybe with some roughness or distortions, they'd probably be better if they were enhanced with, you know, it's, you could see separate strokes and it might be slightly semi-transparent at some, uh, at some portions. So you could simulate the ink, um, strokes or the, the brush strokes much more, uh, much better. And right now, you know, uh, script fonts are hugely popular pretty much everywhere. And still the monochrome outline technology is probably not the best for many, many other kinds of typefaces, you know, um, sans serifs or serif fonts um, intended for body uh, typesetting. The traditional technology is probably the best, but now we have for certain uses, we have the new technology that, um, that is better suited for them and where the traditional technology was just a sort of bad compromise. And you need to remember there are markets for this new way of thinking. For instance, you have to remember, for instance, you know, video games. Video games have been working with color fonts for decades already, but they were not really using font technology. They were using some nasty tricks. They were making big bitmaps with the glyphs and then some primitive tables that told the app, okay, the glyph A is here, the glyph B is here. There was often no kerning. There was often uh, no other, for instance, it was probably quite impossible to, to make it work uh, for complex scripts like Arabic or even perhaps Hebrew. All these things where open type is best, uh, they had to avoid them. They had to come up with their custom solutions. But now we're sort of bringing it into the mainstream. And as the last I checked, you know, the video game industry altogether is like a twenty billion dollars a year uh, business, uh, comparable with with filmmaking these days. So that's one of quite a few different applications where where uh, you know multicolor fonts can be very very useful. So let's have a look at you know, how you would, what kinds of designs you could express using which technology. So this is a very basic layered font. We have two components, you know, the, the one font that is made to make these back, back, background uh, uh, portion and the other font that is used to make the foreground uh, portion. And these are layered and this kind of font can be then stored as a multi-layer font using pretty much all three because it's very native to the Microsoft format. It's just plain vector shapes put together and colorized using solid fills. So the Microsoft format is actually best for them. But of course, since any vector graphic can be rasterized into a bitmap graphic, we can take this, which is uh, infinitely scalable, and we can also store that as, at a certain TPM size, let's say 300 pixels per M as bitmaps, and store that as an SPX. And also because SVG supports these vector graphics and more, uh, this also works uh, using the SVG uh, Adobe Mozilla format. So all three, the Microsoft, the Apple, and the Adobe Mozilla formats are fine for this. Of course, the Microsoft one is probably the best. The Adobe Mozilla one is also good. Then this one, this is another example where actually it probably would have been better if this were a bitmap rather than these sort of simulated auto-traced outline stuff, but it is simulated auto-traced outline stuff, uh, layered with three kind of, three sort of color uh, fills. And that's again, good for all three formats because it's using solid fills. Uh, it's not using any transparency or gradients. This one, again, two components, as it were, two layers. So all three formats fine. This one, of course, this is made out of bitmaps, you know, little stones uh, arranged and photographed and then sort of separated and put into a font. This is something that will work in the Apple SBIX format because it's bitmap based. It will also work with the Adobe Mozilla SVG 
because that supports bitmaps as well, it will not work with the Microsoft format. So, and this again, uh, this is um, um, a font that has been produced using sort of 3D rendering, glyph by glyph, and then assembled together uh, as a font that works using SBIX, Apple's technology, and SVG, Adobe Mozilla, but of course not using Adobe's because we have these fills and gradients and the drop shadow that uses sort of blur and things like that. That's not possible. So first thing that I'm going to show you in terms of tools um, is uh, a combination of Bitfonter, an app that we, we've developed quite a few years ago, and TransType 4, our newest font converter, because that sort of combo allows you to make these color fonts. Well, actually, at the very first, I'll, I'll show you just TransType 4, then add Bitfonter to the mix, and then we'll show you some more stuff. And then, of course, I'll just mention, currently, we are working on a completely new, a brand new uh, font editor. This is an old screenshot from one of the early development builds. Uh, it's codenamed Victoria, but will actually have a proper name uh, when it's released. And that tool, or this set of tools, is already uh, based on, uh, it, it has color built in right away. So you can do all multicolor uh, font formats and, of course, traditional monochrome font formats. It has multi-layer. It allows you to do all kinds of color effects. But that's coming. That's not shipping yet. So um, uh, fontlab.com, you know, uh, see what we're, uh, we're announcing in future. Uh, that's basically the end of my little presentation. And now I want to uh, to switch to uh, some of our tools. So let's start with TransType. TransType um, can build all kinds of um, uh, output fonts and is basically a font converter. But one of these nice um, aspects of TransType is that it also has uh, support for color font formats. So what I'm going to do is I will, uh, whoops, uh, hang on, this is not right. Uh, oh, there you go. Um, I'm going to just grab, yeah, Source Sans Pro. This is, uh, uh, let me just here. Okay, this is an open source font, uh, part of a large family developed by Adobe, um, and it's the traditional font. Um, so what I can do here is, uh, when I'll show you how to make a simple layered fonts very quickly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to duplicate this. Oops, sorry, sorry. This. Way. So I actually now have two copies. Uh, I've used the alt and drag to duplicate. I could also do copy paste. I have two copies of the identical font. Now I'm going to select both using shift. I'm going to go to effects, overlay fonts. And you see that I have a dialog that shows me um, uh, two fonts co colored in two different layers. They're exactly the same fonts on top of each other. So I don't really see the other one. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add some offsets. I'll do 100 in the X and 100 in the Y, or minus 100 in the Y. That's better. Uh, maybe that's too much. I'm going to do 60 and minus 60. Yeah, so now you can see that we have a, uh, a sort of a shadow effect, just a vector shadow appearing here. And um, what I can do also is change this color here. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to keep the greenish, but I'm going to reduce the opacity. So I'm going to actually have the color to be a bit more transparent, like uh, like that. I'm going to hit OK. And here, I've got my font in the preview window. And well, that's just inside of Cranstack, right? So it's called Source and Scroll Layers. I can change the naming here, of course. I could uh, call it, you know, 
shadow or source control shadow one uh, style can be regular. And uh, yeah, and I'm going to do build styling group names. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, okay. So shadow one. Yeah, that's that's enough. So this one, I will select open type TT uh, as the conversion profile, the destination format, because that's the, the one format here that also supports uh, color fonts. I'm going to say destination as get conversion. That's fine. Um, I'm going to say subfolders with postscript. And I'm going to click, uh, point it to the desktop, and say, uh, open. So what I've, I'm doing, what Translate is doing is now building color fonts in all possible formats that are compatible with what I see here. So now I'm going back to my desktop and I see that I, what I got is I got a TTF, just a black and white auto trace. Auto trace. That's really not useful at all. But I've got three uh, different fonts here. One has the suffix color.ttf. That's the one that will work in Microsoft Windows. You can see the effect here because this here, uh, Apple Mac OS 10 does not support the Microsoft format. So it just shows the normal glyphs. But the SPX is a bitmap version. And if I just hit install, um, if I were to hit install, I would get it and it would work right away in text edit. The SVG looks kind of funny here, but if I uh, open the Impalari uh, test page, it's just to you, you know, it's just so that you see how it works. I'm going to drag this one over here, and there you go. It's uh, it's working, and we even have the ligatures uh, working here. So this is SVG. It's uh, not very small because obviously these color fonts, especially the bitmap ones, tend to be quite big, but it is working in Firefox, so uh, it will hopefully at some point also work in Adobe apps because it's the same format. Um, okay, so let's have a look at, let's do it once again. But this time I'm going to do overlay fonts. I'm going to do the same thing. 60 minus 60. Uh, but what I will also do is add to this layer, I'll add blur. So I'll say 40% blur. I should do something. Oh, yeah, that's far too much. Uh, I'll just do 10% blur. Oh, yeah, okay. So now I have um, a solid outline and a blurred background, uh, which I can also do. Semi-transparent, that's fine. Uh, click OK. I got the other one. This is, you know, this is with the solid fill, which I did before. This is the one with the blurred uh, background. So we have a mix of uh, outline and bitmap. Uh, yeah, that's all right. Convert this one. Okay, a translate is outputting uh, the fonts. And uh, okay, whoops, come back to desktop. There you go. And here, I, I can see that this time, Translipe has only output three rather than four fonts. It did the sort of fairly useless, uh, just black and white font. It did the SVG and it did the SPX where it rasterized it. Uh, at um, a certain ppm, it did not output the Microsoft format color because it color the Microsoft format cannot handle the bitmap part. So Translate is intelligent enough to really detect which kinds of uh, techniques a certain font is using and only outputs uh, the, the formats that support it. One important thing about the SPX uh, format output, if you make this layering in Translate's preferences, there is a setting 
say, generate fonts with overlay font effect at 300, 300 pixels per m. That's the default. That's the uh, pixel size for the rasterized glyphs that will go to um, into Transcite. Sorry, into the Epix font, and as you can see, they're pretty big. So this one is, you know, 21 megabytes. Uh, this one is uh, actually six megabyte because it's uh, better compressed because it's just solid uh, shadow, but it's still much bigger than your traditional fonts. Uh, and if you want to make them smaller, for instance, if you make to make a, want to make a web only uh, font or maybe a font for use on some applications, uh, computer games, etc., or maybe on a mobile device, you could change a different resolution, uh, choose a different PPM size. Um, okay, so that's the sort of very easy part, but that's also not, you know, so exciting, is it? So what I'm going to uh, do now is I'll quit Transcype. Well, actually, I started again, just um, sort of fresh. Uh, but I will also use Bitfonter. Now, um, Bitfonter, where is it? Yes, I should. I should start it again. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's that's just on my computer a problem with with it. So Bitfonter is. Uh, it used to be in a native Mac OS ten. Uh, app and a Windows app. Uh, the Mac OS 10 app, unfortunately, uh, no longer works in Mac OS 10.7 or older. So for Mac users, we're now shipping a special sort of version made uh, based on the Windows version that works on any, you know, it works on Mavericks, it works on all the systems. It just sort of looks like the Windows app, uh, more or less. But it, it it works fine. It's not super perfect, but as I said, we're you know, working very hard on completely new versions of, of apps. But at this point, Bitfonter is, uh, you know, the editing environment that you can you can do uh, some stuff with color fonts, uh, often together with it, with Transtype and maybe even FontLab Studio. Um, so what I will do here is uh, I will discuss the photo font format as a sort of intermediary before you uh, create these final fonts, you'll be working with what uh, a format that FontLab has developed uh, some years ago called PHF or PhotoFont. So what I'll do is I'll just open and install font, but you can also open an existing font. Uh, here, I uh, I can choose which. Um, a mode it should open. So it's going to be uh, um, a color mode, 32 millions, that's fine. Um, 200 uh, ppm will be the size that I'm going to import. So I'm going to import a traditional outline font. And that's, that's rasterized into a bitmap font. Now, um, here you can see you could edit stuff here, and that's, you know, quite possible. But um, I'm going to show you some some faster way of working. If you want to make a color font that is sort of derived from an, an existing uh, bitmap font, uh, sorry, outline font, but with some effects. Um, so uh, before, you, uh, before you do something here, you need to go to Tools Options in uh, Bitfonter. And there is a setting in the export section, photo font. And that's the most, uh, pretty much one of the most important things here. Um, the photo font export options uh, is uh, a setting that controls how your uh, font will be, uh, your photo font uh, data will be stored. And uh, there are two options here, inside of font file, outside of font file. Generally, outside of font file for development purposes is much better. As separate images, as one table image, and as one compact image. First, I'm going to show you briefly what it does. 
That's separate images, font bounding box, 50%, that's okay. What I'm gonna do is, I set these options, I'm gonna do save as, uh, photo fonts, I'm gonna make new folder, separate images, go in there, uh, remove the space, I prefer not to use spaces and, and font names, save. Okay, so it's writing images now, and I'm gonna show you in a second what a photo font looks like. Uh, there we go, it should be here, yes. So what I got from Bitfonter is a PHF file, just a very small file, and a set of images. Let's have a look at the images first. So here you see that these are just PNGs um, with each glyph stored as a separate image. It's good enough for some purposes. Um, for some others, uh, it will be better to change the setting. But let's have a look at the photo font because that's, that's the interesting part. Uh, I'm gonna open it in a traditional text editor. So this is um, text made, but it could be, you know, text edit or maybe um, text wrangler uh, or even notepad on Windows. And this is an XML file. So um, a photo font PHF, it's a format that we developed for development purposes primarily. It's an XML file that has a little header that you can edit. Uh, you remember, this is a UPN size 200. It has uh, a Unicode, a glyph to Unicode uh, encoding ta table as an XML, um, which you can edit if you're making some more complicated stuff. And then it has a list of glyph definitions. And let's see, let's look at the exclamation uh, sign here. You see that this is a glyph. It has a name here. It has an information that it's uh, uh, a type is photo, meaning uh, the format is actually a PNG. But then there is a link to the PNG itself, which I've shown you. It's in the form. That's the PNG. And then there's some additional information, the PPM, the bounding box, and the base and delta is actually the uh, the information about um, the advanced width and the, metri the glyph metrics. It's all documented. The format is documented on the website, uh, uh, photofont.com. There is a description of the XML. That's for the one of you who want to sort of fiddle with it uh, a bit. And it's also possible to store kerning here. Uh, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, going to talk about that quite yet. So that's, that's the one way of storing. One small XML file with the extension PHF and images for each separate glyph. Of course, if you know the format, you could, you know, uh, generate these glyph images somehow yourself. But that's, again, a little bit more advanced. The other way, if I were to switch back to Bitfonter, go the tools options and uh, in the options export photo font I set outside of font file but as one table image uh, if I save that I will actually get the PHF the same small XML size and one large PNG and that large PNG contains um, all the glyphs as a sort of a semi-transparent um, uh, font table, it's a it's a fairly large uh, PNG. The nice thing about it is that I can open that PNG uh, in something like Photoshop, and I can use uh, pretty much any effects that I uh, would have wanted. On uh, because these are bitmaps, right? And they're the XML, the PHF file knows which where each glyph is. But I can do something like I select, you know, I use the the magic wand to select all the glyph images. I'll I'm going to do select, modify, expand for pixels. So I have a selection that is slightly larger here. I can do something like 
uh, filter, you know, uh, maybe Gaussian blur. Uh, okay, and I get, you know, these glyph images. Maybe I'm going to do something else. I'm going to do something like, uh, where is that? Sharpen. No, I wanted to do some distort. No, blur. No, sharpen. No. Excuse me. Oh, that doesn't matter. I can do. Oh yeah, render different clouds. Whatever. It's just uh, you know some filter. Of course, you could do some actual work here. And once I you know I save this in Photoshop, I have saved my my. Um, my PNG. So now the PNG uh, should look different. Oops. No, that's. I think that's the PNG I wanted. Yeah. So this is the PNG now. Right. It has the the glyphs with uh, color bitmap effects applied. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to close this and open that particular PNG. Uh, sorry, the PHF, the photo font, of course. Back in Bitfonter. So here, you know, I could do some additional uh, editing. So I've done my big job in Photoshop on the PNG. And I, I opened the PHF, the photo font. I can do some additional work here. I could do some maybe metrics or spacing. Uh, however, again, a different trick. If I go to Tools, Options, um, Outline Font Editor, in this section, Export Outline Font Editor, Export Outline Font into VFB File. I say OK. I say file export outline font uh, doesn't really matter. Um, Liberation Sans VFB, that's fine. I save it. What I get here is a VFB that I can open in FontLab Studio. Uh, that maybe that was wasn't such a great idea. Uh, let me do that again because after all, I would need to do some tweaking. Uh, excuse me, export outline font. Uh, yeah, this is. Uh, Just so you know, yeah. Adam, we've uh, out of time. Okay. Yeah. I'll. So uh, let me let me sort of finalize this very quickly, and then I'll I'll show you the last the last bit. So um, so here I can uh, in the out export uh, options I can. Set the uh, auto tracing. I'm going to export this, replace, open it here. What I get here is an auto trace version of my PHF. What I can do here is I can do all the traditional work such as metrics, kerning, and even open type feature development. And then after I'm done here, uh, let's say I'm going to just make a um, a kerning pair. Oh, this one doesn't have kerning pairs. I'm going to do an extreme kerning pair and then save the metrics of the font uh, as an AFM in Bitfonter. You can also do a kerning and metrics editing right in Bitfonter, but in FontLab Studio, you can use things like class kerning and you know pretty much everything that you, you've learned. Here, imports, metrics, choose that one. Um, Metrics data, you know, kerning data, uh, add imported to the current font. OK, done. Now I'm going to do save. And the nice thing is that, you know, once I've saved, uh, I've saved it in Photoshop, uh, sorry, in Bitfonter. Let me have a look. What I do have here is this PHF, uh, the, the XML that I've worked on. I have the PNG that has all the glyph data in this one big table. I've also previously prepared uh, 
a feature definition file with the same file name, which has a kerning and some ligature information, uh, a ligature, um, ligature feature here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get this PHF, open transtype, uh, open this PHF in transtype, and what I'll do here is again generate. Mm, and say open and what i'm generating here is um an open type font with uh where is that where is that oh sorry um where was that sorry 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 um now i got lost in my folders oh there there it was uh boom, boom, boom. Go away. Uh, yes, here, over here. Right. So what I have here is the font I prepared working in Mac OS 10 would work right away also in iOS. Um, the SVG version will also work, um, again, because it was bitmap based, it would not work in a Microsoft uh, format. And just to, to as a sort of a, uh, a sort of a proof, I'm going to open this in in uh, uh, DTL OT master and just to show you that it also has the uh, should have okay it has the current feature for some reason it did not uh, register the uh, the GSAP feature but uh, normally I may have made a, a little mistake but uh, it's it's definitely possible to build basically if you have a PHF your PNG and your feature definition file transtype will build an open type font with the SPX or SVG with the glyphs from the PNG, with the metrics and Unicode information from the PHF, and from the with the open type feature definitions from uh, the feature definition file that you supply. So you have a fully working open type font. Uh, so that's sort of um, uh, the most important bits on color fonts, building color fonts using um, Bitfonter and Transtype. And I hope uh, you have now a, a sort of a, a better picture and a sort of a, a kickstart towards the process. And of course, the whole thing is much more extensive. So what I'll do is I'll allow some time for questions if you have them. I see that there's a chat window. I'm not you, you sure. Questions in the chat window there. I did want to ask a question, Adam. Um, I don't know. Would it take very long to show us how to take something from Bitfonter into Transtype? Oh, I I think I I did just that. I I Why saved a studio. You no, know, I I saved a PHF from Bitfonter and then I opened it in Transtype. So here it's in Transtype. And then uh, uh, I generated a font. Um, I generated a font in um, in Transtype. I have the aspects here. So what I could do is, of course, open FontLab add and just, you know, test it. So open the SVG and say, hello. Bits and here I can, you know, uh, make this background disappear and uh, set set the size and generate as a PNG, PDF, SVG that particular text that I have and put it back into Photoshop, InDesign, whatever I need. Very good. Um, I saw one question there. Uh, there was one user in Bitfonter with the Wine environment and said copy-paste doesn't work. Is that a some bug in the uh, Wine environment? Um, it's unfortunately very likely that um, that it doesn't work. I'll try to I'll try to investigate it. I mean uh, the Wine version, the Bitfonter Wine version that we've prepared. Uh, it's possible that I'll, I'll try to. To see whether uh, there there 
there is a better way to building this. Um, so, er, okay. yeah, right now I just acknowledge it, and I must say that you know it's it's not an ideal um, solution, obviously, but uh, I'll 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 look into this issue. Also, I was thinking you might want to show us some URLs of some places that people can go get some sample color fonts to play with. Right. Well, there aren't too many quite yet, but there is one test font uh, that is that we have on the fontlab.com slash pad uh, that comes uh, comes along. That's actually the 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 mm, the font that I showed uh, before, um, the Ringo Blingo, which is the this one. Um, and uh, well, because obviously there we'll we'll make we'll make uh, a few more available. Uh, but the point, of course, is that you know uh, the uh, there aren't. I mean, first, there aren't too many of these color fonts out there yet, and especially not necessarily some that, uh, as far as I know, no font distributor is selling them yet yet uh, in these formats. Uh, so I believe companies such as you know MyFonts or uh, or websites such as MyFonts or Fonts.com or FontShop or others will probably will need to sort of upgrade their uh, systems to be able to sell these fonts if you create them. But it's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. So you know if I think if you'd like uh, some of the font distributors uh, to 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 allow these types of fonts to be sold if, if you want to create them, uh, you know, just let them know that you'd like to do that and then um, they will be able to work on that, I guess. I see a good, I see a good question here. Um, is there an optimum resolution for photo fonts, which would cover all the bases as far as different font sizes are concerned? Is there a point at which a certain resolution might be an overkill? That's a very good question. And uh, well, uh, I have experimented uh, with different um, sizes, and I must say that, uh, well, first of all, one important thing is, you know, it's uh, print is a not, is sort of it's easier to print in one color or two colors than in four or eight. With the screen, it's very different. Scre a screen is a naturally colorful medium, so obviously. Many of these multi-color font uh, font formats are better off on a screen, or that's their more natural medium. Um, and there, you just sort of go. Uh, what I found is sort of up to 600, between 400 and 600 ppm, is pretty much the optimum. And uh, you know, you largely, if you think of a typical HD resolution. It's a thousand pixel in the vertical, and but you rarely get an application where you have your glyphs taking up the entire height. You know, still it's usually about so half the typical vertical resolution of what you might get to see is probably good. The upscaling works. It's kind of like with websites. You know, if you're preparing website graphics. Um, then the similar type of, uh, I would say, half of what your normal website graphic optimal resolution would be um, is probably enough, and it works well on you know the, the iOS on even Retina screens. The Ringo Blingo uh, font that I sort of engineered together with the designer, it's based on I believe a 600 ppm, and it really works well in everywhere I tested. Um, and of course, and one important thing is uh, they all print. So it's not like, you know, that, another question is how are they printable? And um, and it's uh, definitely so that they all print because the, you know, whether it's a, it's a, it's Word or Pages or, um, or a browsers, if they show, if they can show it on the screen, they can print it. Uh, they can make a PDF. The PDF creation is sort of a little bit tricky in the behind, but it actually works. Uh, what you end up with in these um, PDFs, for instance, is uh, you have a transparent sort of font embedded in the PDF with no glyphs. 
that has the right boxes and it's selectable. And on top of each location of the glyph is the bitmap image. But it's to the end user, it feels like it's, it's still selectable text uh, in the PDF. So that works, uh, that works uh, pretty well. Um, the online documentation of how to use what apps in what order, uh, we haven't quite done it yet. So the, you know, the little bits that I've uh, showed today is, um, is probably if you rewatch the recording, that's sort of the, the key portions that I've shown, but I'll, I'll, um, I'll prepare a sort of a blog post on blog.fontab.com, a sort of compressed version of the most important steps uh, within the, uh, let's say, the next uh, two to three weeks. Um, because yes, th there is a bit of back and forth, but uh, so I'll, 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 I'll document it, um, I'll document it in writing on the FontLab blog uh, in the next two to three weeks. Are the MyFonts Telefonts protocol? Okay, so I can't, um, so my fonts, yes. So as far as I know, um, my fonts uh, do support the single layers. Um, so not the pre-layered fonts that you can sell as a package, uh, but actually the fonts, the ingredient fonts uh, that then the user would have to layer, be it using you know transtype or CSS trickery or just by layering boxes of text in InDesign. Uh, there, are, there are quite a few of them. So if you look on my fonts, they're like layered fonts. There are quite a few people who have made them, but they're only selling the ingredients, so to say. You have, to, as the end user, has to cook it uh, himself. What is part because these, you know, these renderers that the uh, font distributors use, etc. They're all not aware of these new color tables because, as I said, there are four different ones of them. So it's still not, you know, it's, but it, it's it's similar to what happened, you know, three years ago with web fonts. First, there was like EOT and WAF, and nobody had heard about them. But then some companies started making them. Some start, some companies uh, started selling them, and now you know web fonts are everywhere, and pretty much every you know app knows what an EOT and especially WAF is. And here's, it's a similar situation. It has to sort of get rolling. Uh, the infrastructure in the operating system systems is there, but there are these different flavors, you know, color, SBIX, SVG. Um, but I think it's still worthwhile. And if you have these color fonts, you know, you can also, you know, I'm very happy in my email address, adam at fontab.com. Um, you know, you're most welcome if you have um, um, specific questions, if you have uh, samples, if you have uh, even some things where you may get stuck, but it's an interesting design and you might want some help from us to build the fonts. And in exchange, we at FontLab might perhaps get the right not to distribute the fonts, but just to showcase them and to show to other people, that would be great. So we will be happy to help you build perhaps these fonts if you run into some trouble at this point, uh, because we also need, you know, your input. We'll be working on better tools to do it sort of in one step without going back and forth into trickery. But for that, of course, it, it would be great to have working samples. You know, so far, I've only had a few designers who, who uh, you know, sent me the artwork. One of the things that I, you know, I would love to see is just, you know, hand, written type with sort of watercolor stuff, but then also, you know, maybe, well, scanned in a high resolution quality and maybe then with the background removed. So just even a couple of high resolution PSDs uh, that, that shows, you know, the half transparency calligraphy just as a demo, but because I think it will be mind blowing people don't necessarily, when they see it, they've seen these, you know, stone color, stone font and say, yeah, that's nice, but it's maybe not necessarily, but it was just one direction. You know, we had in the early days of photo fonts, we had some artists, just a handful, 
who were doing these these fonts out of physical objects like you know stones and things like that and they they made a few and we used them as demos but uh but now it's really possible to explore all kinds of uh, possibilities even you know taking uh, the um uh, a historical specimen of a garamond, uh, a high resolution scan with the, you know, ink, uh, ink spread and sort of artifacts of typographic print, scanning at high resolution and making a bitmap based version of a garamond or of a catalan that has the, not the clean, you know, outline and the nice sort of high uh, the, the the digital version but sort of more like an analog version an analog digital version things like that there are countless of possibilities and i'm very happy to help you uh with the guys because i'm really sort of passionate about it and i really would want to see uh your work and your interest in it and you know any any anywhere we can help and maybe we can put together you with some guys who are more technically um or maybe you know if 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 one of you people listening there would be interested in sort of learning let's say how to deal with these technical issues and maybe work with some other designers who don't want to do through this entire technical process we could do that as well i mean we could you know help you uh get in touch and maybe have a a font engineer that is interested in specializing in this just like there are font engineers who specialize in, you know, open type feature development or hinting, I think there will be a few people out there um, who might want to uh, to specialize on this. Okay. Um, Did you see are there the any more? Uh, okay. Colors. You have to scroll back. Um, um, I remember you telling me when we were at the the Microsoft meeting in Portland that not all colors were supported. I'm pretty sure by Microsoft for sure they're kind of muted colors or subdued. Oh uh, no, yeah, the yeah the the overall the overall um, thing is that in all these formats it's just RGB. So uh, there are very much you know made for for print uh, for screen, but it's not really uh, easy to um to define let's say pantones or because there yeah there there are some companies who would want or like to be so yeah when it comes to color management it gets a bit tricky so for example let's imagine you have a a color font that you're using for your branding so you actually make a logo you know a corporate logo that just uses two colors maybe uh, consisting out of some typed uh, letter forms, you make it into a color font, sell it to the customer, and say, "Okay, here's here's your logo. The red and the blue corporate colors are embedded in the font, so the office user won't be able to change them or misuse uh, that as well. That will work, but these colors will only be RGB. So when it comes to going this into print." When it hits the PDF, it will be possible to do some pre-flight and whatever. But um, things like uh, color profiles that gets a bit complicated at this point. And um, is there some palette you can see someplace that shows you what the palette is? Not quite yet. No, it's not. So the the color palette is still. I don't. I'm not aware of any app that uh, displays that. Um, probably we should add this palette to FontLab Pad at some point. I'll, 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 I'll uh, talk with our developers about that. Um, I was just thinking when you were inside TransType, maybe, I don't know, is, is that limiting you there to a certain palette when you were doing your overlays in TransType? Um, it's, uh, it's all... Uh, yeah, it's it's all it's all again it's all um, it's all RGB. So let's have a look at it again. One, two, overlay. Um, so here we have a color picker. We can use the standard uh, uh, color selection tools, of course, and we can use the RGB notation. Uh, but that's that's about it. So that's that's only RGB internally because 
essentially the glyphs are stored as PNGs and PNGs use RGB, or they use they're stored using SVG, also based on PNG uh, on RGB colors or RGBA, I should say, with uh, alpha uh, as is PNG, so RGBA actually, red, green, blue, alpha. And for the Microsoft uh, format, um, I'm actually not sure how, whether it does support alpha, I believe not. So it's just plain RGB colors uh, at this point. Um, yeah, so. Okay. Um, any more questions, questions or? I don't see, well, I've, I've looked, I think I, uh, I, I answered a few. Yes, process. So yes, so it's not spot colors. It's just process colors, and it's only RGB. I answered um, the documentation, the resolution, the ninety-nine. Yeah, the the pricing, the special pricing for Bitfonter. Uh, that's already been noted. Um, yeah, I don't. Yeah, and then. So, um, as I said, if you you know if you have more, if you have questions specific to uh, that topic, um, or if you have any submissions or samples or something that you want to share with us, which we could you know spread the word and also uh, test ourselves our new apps, or if you run into any trouble, drop me a line, Adam at fontlab.com. I'm, I'm I'm definitely. Uh, very interested in in that, and you know, sometime later this year, you should see uh, sort of more powerful tools. One thing that I haven't covered is it's also possible to make full SVG based um, fonts using the PHF format. But for that, I'm actually write a blog post about it because it's slightly complex. It's not possible to do it with Bitfonter. But uh, uh, yeah, PHF, as we originally developed it, allowed only PNG graphics, but it's also actually possible to do SVG. So it's possible, although that's a bit more copy pasting, to do things like you develop your glyphs in Illustrator, you save each of these glyphs as an SVG graphic, and then you sort of compile this PHF a little bit yourself, and it's it's doable. It's it's just a bit um, it's just a bit um, what's the word? Um, well, not complex, but um, yeah, it's it involves a, a tiny little bit of hackery. But I hope I can make a blog post about it that will make it uh, easier for you. Um, and the new tools will support it much easier. Okay. Let me I ask think, you. Do you think yeah. that we did you right where maybe. Sometimes towards the end of the summer, you might do something for us like uh, open type features, or would you uh, ever want let's, to do a webinar? Let's see. Oh, yeah, that's a good question here, George Grant. If you create a photo font using an existing font, are there copyright issues? That is a very good question, which um, I, um, I would not be able to answer. Well, certainly. You know the. You should ask the author about that. Um, in, I mean, legally speaking, certainly the trademarks, so the names are, you know, certainly protected. So you can't take, let's say, an you know Adobe font minion and then make a bitmap version with some effects and then put it together uh, and also call it minion or uh, blur. Um, when it comes to the actual. Some of the data inside the fonts may be protected, especially things like kerning and metrics. Uh, if you use outlines and rasterize them, and then sort of make the raster, rasterized images available, uh, that depends. Uh, that depends. I mean, it's generally speaking probably not a good idea to try this. Uh, what you can certainly do is you can use open source uh, fonts. Um, and then you can sort of adhere to that license. This is what we do. So usually, you know, when we do demos now, we use uh, one of the open font license license fonts, such as uh, Source Sans Pro, for instance, or Liberation, 
or Apache 2 license funds, and with them you can play, and there are quite a few of them. Oh, I see, more other people using yours. Well, you know, that's basically, I would consider this a conversion, and it's similar to, you know, other people taking your desktop font and making web fonts out of them, you know, WAFs or, as, or, or EOTs. Um, probably if they make these bitmap, you know, it's, uh, it's when it comes to, you know, suing and everything, then it becomes complicated because legally speaking, uh, the copyright protection, you know, it, it's, um, uh, I would say there is a certain, it's slightly different, you know, some people might, might argue that the rasterized bitmaps are no longer your property uh, unless you can um, sort of make a, a, you know an argument that is actually the design that is yours because then then it is protected rather than the actual outlines. Um, indeed, if your EULA uh, prohibits creation of derivatives, then it is an issue, um, especially if you really take the original font data. You know, in some uh, in some trickery, you could. Some people might argue, okay, I'm just typeset the entire alphabet in Photoshop without using the original font, convert it to bitmaps. Uh, actually, do something like this. Mm. Uh, I don't see that one. Okay, sorry, I can't. I can't really find the. The sample I was looking for, but um, well, maybe here. No, it uh, doesn't matter. Um, I'll try still. Ah, okay, yes, this is a good example. So, this one here, uh, this is actually made, you know, typesets the entire alphabet in Photoshop, applied some. Uh, filtering and then do oh because I what I didn't mention is uh, that's silly me I should have mentioned that in Bitfunter of course that's the the, the real fun part it's definitely possible um, I should have mentioned that uh, still oh Jesus uh, just let me it's uh, it's possible to open a image. Um, where's desktop, 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 users, excuse me. Mm. Yep. It's possible to open an image and then do separate shapes. Um, there's some that's basically Bitfonter has scan font built in. Um, so what I can then uh, do here is I can select all these shapes and I can say place into font, start from, oh yeah, A to Z, A to Z, new font, okay, okay. And oh yeah, it got confused a bit, so I would have to uh, this is now a glyph name and doing a code generate names. Okay. Right, so now I have so this was the quick version, you know, without starting from an existing font, but actually imagining that this was just a scanned image of an alphabet or maybe you know something that you had handwritten using uh, the sort of scan font type of action. So you scan, you open an image, you do image separate shapes, then there's some trickery with the baseline and uh, you, can, you can sort of uh, make sure that every single glyph is in its own box and then you can sort of drag and drop uh, these glyphs into a a font that you're working on 
inside of Bitfounder. So that becomes a bit more manageable as well. If I do, you know, these, boom, and then these. Yeah, and then I can just go ahead and do uh, a photo font once I've completed uh, my uh, my uh, character set, sort of dropping it. And of course, you know, so this is this is this is the way which I didn't originally mention to really get original artwork scanned uh, into uh, Bitfonter, and then ultimately into uh, photo font. Um, so Adam, are you saying like what if you drew on paper your interpretation of Garamond and then you scanned it, then you would not be stealing Garamond? Um certainly not. I think, you know, it's it's basically in a sense, it's very similar to, you know, to derivatives of other designs. I mean, the fact that it's color fonts is not so uh, different from if you had, you know, if I scan this uh, and then I auto trace and make an outline font out of it, legally it's not much of a difference uh, from when I just, you know, take the scanned images and and produce the an SPX color font. It's it's the same thing whether you know whether I I use tracing and output it as a vector or whether I output it as bitmaps legally. There's not much difference. So I would say 98% of what you've learned about copyright issues and you know uh, derivatives and revivals and things like that in outline fonts and traditional type they apply here as well. Not much difference. Of course, if you take somebody else's fonts, overlay them, and produce using Transpect produce layered fonts, uh, these probably would uh, it would probably be 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 uh, okay for the user to to use it on his own machine, also depending on the EULA. But it certainly won't uh, be legal for the user to you know buy some layered some ingredients from my fonts, produce a version, and then sell it or distribute it himself. Um, but that's again that's that's the same as with any other type of font conversion, and with our tools, you know, we when you first start Transtype, you are being lectured about um, intellectual property issues, and we prominently display um, the, you know, it's 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 quite easy to for the people to see the the license, uh, the EULA. Uh, that was one of the things that we did uh, specifically to make sure that um, that end users. Uh, and it's not possible in Transtype to change any of these. You can change the family name, but it's not possible to delete somebody's designer name, copyright, and license. So that will stay, and that I hope will be a, a, a certain deterrent from people to, you know, appropriate other people's work. Okay, it's um, now 96 minutes. I wanted to ask you one final question. If I were yeah. a kid who was all excited about this and I dedicate my life to color fonts, I become real close friends with Adam and ask him to help me. What if I were to go to some famous font designer like Matthew Carter and say, hey, I know you have not got the time, you don't want to go to the trouble, but I will convert your fonts to color for you. I wonder if there's a market there for some aspiring young font designer. I believe there is. I believe there is. I mean, I, you know, but I'm, I'm a big, I mean, it's, it's, there, there's, when, when this was presented last year and we, when we originally did photo fonts, uh, font, font lab in 2003, it was like 11 years ago, there wasn't really much interest or there was some people who were saying, yeah, who needs that? But, um, I think, especially with these, I must say, you know, on 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 these devices, you know, on the on uh, the iPhone or on the iPad, the color fonts really just look, you know, absolutely spectacular. And if now it's possible to install um, 
third-party fonts on an iOS device uh, using this app. Question: What if you were to say, "Hey, I want to start making emoji fonts for cell phones"? Uh, what if I spend a lot of time with Adam, and then I make these, and someday Nokia or somebody will buy them and put them on the next uh, smartphone? Well, that's how it. That's how it started, and there, there certainly is, there certainly is an, uh, a market for it. And I think it also is. Uh, what I find it interesting is that I think it also potentially opens up um, a market for creators of a type of a different kind. So people who, for instance, were very talented letterers or calligraphers who in their analog work always incorporated color. And for them, the color or the structure uh, of the lettering was also very always very important. And they were sort of deterred from going into type design because the traditional type design concept sort of stripped all that and allowed you to only do these plain monoline, uh, monochrome outlines with maybe some simulated effects or something. So, so the richness of the medium, the medium was very flat. And I think now, you know, uh, people will, um, who, who are doing, um, lettering, uh, maybe very decorative, but maybe simply just, you know, just, just regular lettering, but don't want to be just black and white, period. They may be just one, you know, four shades of gray. With color fonts, it is even possible to do, you know, your lettering maybe with just two shades of a particular color. There may be, you know, black and 80% of the black, or black and black, 80% uh, transparent. And that already can give you some um, powerful um, manipulation technique. So, you know, once you introduce color, you don't necessarily have to go, you know, the full, uh, you know, fonts made out of trees. It can be fonts made out of uh, good lettering that is where you're not just limited to one color, but you can sort of have slight variation. And I think design-wise, you know, conceptually, it will, it will uh, certainly, mm, oh, it, we will see many, many, you know, new opportunities. So basically, I think right now the whole sans serif area is very crowded. And, you know, everybody is trying to make a yet another sans serif, yet another sans serif where there's so many. Um, and other fields and scripts, I would say, you know, all the people who have made script fonts so far, they will probably uh they they would do well you know revisiting some of their popular designs but going back to the calligraphic sources and maybe making a 2.0 version with uh, really the the sort of the rich stuff you know not not just uh trace so oh yeah absolutely graffiti i i I've, I've actually spoken to you know pascal zorbi has made a great Arabic, an Arabic font based on, uh, I think, two or three different kinds of graffiti from uh, Beirut, and he um, he did uh, he he made it as a sort of black and white trace with ink splatter and everything. And now he's looking into actually using the original footage to making it you know more true to the source because. He basically, you know, he, he did it all the way on, up onto a digital font and now it's sort of like, it's a bit less authentic and, you know, it's a nice exercise, but it just doesn't do justice to what you're trying to express. So it's kind of like, you know, you're trying to, uh, to do, um, um, a symphonic orchestra recording, but you only have a, you know, mono eight bit, uh, the quality, sound quality, uh, it may be fine, but and may be fine for uh, a lot of things, but maybe for the symphonic orchestra, it really should be, uh, you know, a more more uh, more varied uh, medium, a bit more high resolution. Again, the the physical size of the font certainly uh, is an issue. 
because you know if you want to if you do a 400 ppm font or 600 ppm font with a larger character set like 400 glyphs you know latin extended you end up you're looking at something like 30 meg so mm, for web fonts if it's a bitmap version, if it's a, you know, if it's the Microsoft uh, format is very, very uh, compact and that adds very little overhead because it's, it's, it's outline only. But the bitmaps do increase the size, but that's, you know, true for, for well, with SVG, uh, it will be possible to, to sort of come to a very uh, sensible um, mid well, compromise. And, you know, think of app developers, game developers, app developers. I think that's certainly a very interesting um, market for you right there. Okay. So I guess we're about done. Should we invite everybody to our secret backdoor meeting at TypeCon in Washington, D.C. at the end of July? Well, I'm not, maybe we should mention it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't think it will be secret. I think we're, you know, we 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 certainly want to to host a couple of meetings in the the conferences, so uh, at TypeCon and at ATypePy, um, so TypeCon in Washington and ATypePy in Barcelona. But yeah, we don't have really any details yet. But you know, I don't think it will be secret. So we'll be announcing it. Okay, so you all hack traveling expenses. Well. Uh, okay. Let's I go ahead and mine. hack for uh, there's these things like GoFundMe and, and Kickstarter will raise money for people to uh, get their airplane ticket. Uh, well, <laughs> we will not necessarily pay anyone's ex ex expenses, <laughs> unfortunately. But, you know, um, uh, well, uh, at the very least, let us know what you're doing with these color fonts. I'm, I'm really, I, I really want to, you know, to see what's happening and what you can uh, produce, you know, knowing what you already know. And if you have questions, ask me. I'm available. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, guys. I hope it was uh, useful and worthwhile. And um, I'm going to ask everybody to give a standing ovation and just stand right there next to your computer, and we'll see some applause coming. Here. See you guys at our next webinar, May 13. Uh, keep watching the forum for the webinars, and also we hope to see Adam again later this summer. I hope so too. Thank you. Thank you. See you next time. Thank you. Bye bye, guys. Thanks.